Good morning, everybody. That's not correct. It's good afternoon, but it feels like a morning, right? We've all been out in Berlin. Um, <laughs> And uh, it, there's more to come. Um, hi, so I'm Lewis. This is my business partner, Nate. We formed the London Bar Consultants in 2012, um, and we've been helping bars reorganize their training structures, writing menus, stuff like that, launching new bars, launching new um, hotels, restaurants, uh, all, across, um, all across the world. Um, but we're here today to talk about training. Um, we've named it planting. Oh, it's, it's gone, but um, <laughs> we... we <laughs> From the, from the ground up, um, one of the things that Nate and I do, um, actually jumping back one second, uh, we have two bars in the city of London, they're both called Merchant House. Uh, one of them has 500 whiskies. Um, we launched that about a month ago. And our other bar uh, that we launched about two years ago uh, has 700 combined collection of gin and rum. And we presented ourselves with this incredible collection which posed an instantaneous problem. And that's at the absolute core of what we're talking about today. How do you get your staff to engage with the products that you're carrying uh, without just pushing incentives on certain brands that you're being incentivized to, to push on your bar or upselling. So we do things rather differently at Merchant House and at, at the core of our company. So I'm really glad you joined us today to hear a little bit about that. I hope that you have something to take away from it. Um, it's an amazing place to be, BCB. Um, there are thousands of people collected here and the combined knowledge in these rooms is, is, is incredible. And if you're in the hospitality sector and you're not here right now, you're nuts. Um, there are distillers, blenders, um, Coopers, hoteliers, restaurateurs, we're all here in this combined place and it's an amazing place to network and share our knowledge. Um, but uh, drawing back to uh, Merchant House and the way we do things, um, we've done it in direct response to a number of problems that we've spotted over the number of years. And it's why we formed the company to start with. Um, I could or we could have turned our talk here into 45 one-minute rants about our industry. <laughs> we're not going to do that, or at least we're going to try not to do that. Um, oh, yeah. Um, if I offend anybody, I, please take it with a pinch of salt. We're not here to offend, but we do want to draw attention to some of these issues that we see as real issues. We want to ask ourselves what it feels like when you walk through the doors of your restaurant, hotel, whatever it is, what it feels like if you've never been there before as a guest that doesn't know what they're walking into rather than as the person that knows the guy behind the bar and gets the massive high five and like that, drinks on the bar, slide them across. That doesn't happen for Joe Public. So that's one of the, problem, that's one of the differences that we want to highlight and um, some of the problems that we've spotted in line with that. Um, do you want to dive in on some of the problems? Uh, yeah, thanks, yeah, bribes. Um, no, um, we, uh, we've got a very interesting relationship with brands. You would think that uh, we'd be on good terms when we, we try and have so many. And to have um, such big collection in the bars isn't something we wanted to do to say, oh, look how many gins and rums and whiskies we have. That's not what we want. What we focus on instead is a slightly different guest experience. We want them to try different products and get kind of beyond the brands, we want them to not drink brands, which kind of puts us in the bad books with the brands that kind of run the industry, which is a bit of an issue, but they'll get over it. Because we're, we're quite honest with our guests. We tell them the brand message, and we tell them why these brands are made the way they are and why they taste the way they do. So I'll, I'll give you um, an example um, of what happens when a guest walks into one of our bars. So let's go, let's go to the new whiskey bar, and they'll walk in. And if anyone's been in one of our bars, you'll probably have seen um, the interesting way we'll lay out our spirits in that they're all thrown up against a wall, all up against the back bar with no seeming order. We don't group things. We don't have gins over here and rums over here. We don't subdivide. We don't have Jamaican rums and then Barbados rums and then spice rums because we don't have any fucking spice rums. Um, and a guest comes in and they see that and they're, they're taken aback. And they'll, it's like when you walk into a cafe and it lists chicken tikka and shepherd's pie and fish and chips. And you're like, I don't know what to order. I haven't got a clue. It's called the tyranny of choice. And the tyranny of choice is something that we deliberately create. We don't want our guests to go, ah, Diplomatico, fantastic. I'll drink that. Um, I have a sweet tooth. Um, what our guests do is they walk in and go, oh, Jesus, I have no idea. Have you got a list? I'm like, no, we don't have a list. We're not going to write down 300 gins, 300 rums, or whatever it turns out to be that day. It's not going to happen. They come in and they say, ah, oh, 
I haven't a clue. What am I going to drink? Have you got a list? No, we don't. What sort of thing do you want? What do you actually want to drink? Are you after something fresh? You have something lighter? Oh, gin and tonic. Give me a gin and tonic. Fantastic. I'll give you a gin and tonic. What kind of thing are you after? Something light, something rich, something different? And it's not enough just to say, oh, yes, I'll have a citrusy gin and tonic, and for me to go and pour them something with grapefruit in it and give it to them and go, there you go, that's citrusy. It's got a grapefruit wedge in it. That'll do. I've grouped that under citrus in my mind, and that's enough for you. That's not going to work. We have to teach our staff the reason why all these gins are citrusy or all these rums are dark or all these rums are light and fresh or the way these whiskies, I mean, we're not going to use the word fruity. God, why do we still use the word fruity? Do you know what's fruity? Strawberry yogurt is fruity. Fucking apricots are fruity. Stop using the word fruity to describe a spirit. It's ridiculous. And smooth. Oh, it's so smooth. No, piss off. Um, a bit of a rant, sorry. Um, so the guests will come in and they want to try something different and we'll say, oh, right, we've given this. And we'll put it in front of them and go, yeah, this is number three. Um, it's all very Mayfair and St. James's. It's made in the Netherlands. Um, they've got three fruits and three spices and off the fruits, one's orange and one's grapefruit. Isn't it fab? Look at that. Taste it. And the guests will taste it and go, oh, yeah, you're right. It is grapefruit. Fab. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I don't know why it's my mother. Oh, great. Um, and they see the grapefruit and they taste the grapefruit and they get that confirmation bias. And that exchange, that reaction, goes from this horrible position of the guest walking in and saying, I haven't a clue, to them taking a drink that's actually something they want to drink. They don't care that it says number three on the bottle. They don't really care what the brand is. They're not coming in on a branding exercise. They're coming in to have a drink. So we start by creating the tyranny of choice. But then how do you train all your staff to know about all these products. And it's kind of what the talk is about, not so much our little brands. And jump, jumping back on that as well, um, Nate mentioned there that uh, we didn't want to have this large collection. Um, we actually got rid of about 150 gins from our previous collection. If anyone knows our history, you'll understand the logic there. But um, we used to own another bar. We got rid of 150 gins. So it wasn't about having a large collection. It wasn't about having the largest collection. We wanted the most diverse, most interesting collection. Um, and that's why it's continually growing all the time. And certain products might drop off and then new products will come in. Uh, but the reality is, the experience that Nate's just suggested that you would have if you walked into our bar or one of our bars is very different to what we think Joe Public receives when they walk into any average bar. One of my favorite experiences is when I walk into some of the best named bars in the world. Let's look at um, world's 50 best bars just for a second. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going there. Um, uh, but let's just say I walk into one of these bars. Some of them I love, by the way. Um, I walk into one of these bars, can I have a gin and tonic? Yep, straight away, brand comes out the speed rail. In it goes, maybe it's with Fever Tree, lucky me. Um, and it's, it's paired up and it's served straight over. And it's like, is that really going to be the best drink for me right now? I could be making that at home for a tenth of the price. I could be drinking it next door for the same price. Why did I come to your bar to drink it here and receive effectively a slap in the face? By the way, that's 15 quid. Whoa. I'm not coming back. <laughs> and that's at the core of what we're preaching. It's more about retention of your guests and of your staff than it is about the acquisition of new guests. Everyone focuses on, and let's draw into a bar specifically here. I will focus on selling my bar to people that haven't been to my bar so that then they will come to my bar and then I am full. Instead of actually looking after the people that are in your bar already, that are getting the experience that you are selling to them, this is business, and asking them to come back. That's effectively the difference here. <laughs> well done. Um, thanks for having a dig at 50 best bars. Um, so it, in the beginning, there's recruitment. This is where it all starts, and it's why you hire people. And I guess this is where we start doing things our way and not the usual way. If we had a large whiskey collection and someone comes in and drops a CV and says, I used to work in X whiskey bar and this whiskey bar, and I know about whiskeys, I'll throw that in the bin. Well, not you're allowed. I think I have to keep it. We keep it, but we don't call them. Because we feel like we can't rely on their experience. And, and that sounds really, um, well, bitchy, but I'll explain why. No. Can, I, can I just elaborate on that? Just to, just to be really clear on this point, the more bars you've worked in, the less likely you are to be employed by us. Just really simply put. And, and we'll explain why. It does sound bitchy. Um, because when you, when you come in, um, where was my train of thought now? Um, and you, you've got a lot of experience on your CV. That's not what we're after. We're after people with no experience. We want to train them from the ground up, as the talk goes, um, and planting seeds. 
Um, because we, we start by um, hiring someone we would want to have a drink with. That's the only criteria, because at the end of the day, that's what our guests do. They come in and they have a drink with our staff. All right, and that's what, makes, that's what makes our bar what it is. So we don't care where they've worked. We don't care that they've got all this experience. We don't care if they've done WSETs or any of these courses, which are very good. We, um, we just want someone who's just a nice person. Is she, is she great crack? Is he, has he got a bit of a laugh to him? Can he smile? Can he communicate with me? That's all we're after. Once they pass that test, great, they're on board. When we get to that, um, the first thing we introduce them to is something called the Golden Circle. It's a bit of a cheesy American thing. If you haven't heard of it, do look it up. Give it a quick Google. There's TED Talks and stuff. It's quite fun. Um, but what it does is it just focuses on why you're there, why you get up in the morning, why you come in. You ask a chef who's busting his ass ridiculous hours why he gets up at silly o'clock in the morning to come in. And it's not going to be for the pay. It's not going to be for the, oh, yeah, I go in and see my mates. And, oh, yeah, we did shots of Jaeger class. No, it's going to come in because he cares about his craft and he cares about his job. And that's what we want from the people that work with us, is that they come in and they do it for the right reason. For us, it's all about the guest. We want to embrace what hospitality really is. We want to embrace looking after the people that are in our bars, which is why they're called merchant house. The house is a very deliberate term there. We want it to feel like home to a lot of people. So we give them the golden circle and we show them why. We tell them why they do it. Um, and then you're faced with the actual training. And the training, there's two types of training. Um, the first is the one that most bars will go down. And it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. It's got a lot of problems. The first is where they'll come in and go, um, well, you've got experience. Let's rely on your experience. OK, cool. You know how to make a mojito. Go on, make yourself a mojito. Oh, but we don't, we don't use gum. We use, we use brown sugar. OK, cool. But yeah, carry on. You know what you're doing. Fab. Oh, yeah, daiquiri, no, no, we don't use Havana for that. We use Doherty's three. And all you're doing to that person that's come in to work on your bar, you've said to them, yeah, you know what you're doing, but don't do it that way. And it's incredibly disheartening. It's very negative. And you're just being told time and time again, yeah, no, 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 don't do that either. And it's a slap on the wrist after a slap on the wrist. And eventually, they're just going to go, right, I've had enough. I don't really care. I'll just go work next door. I enjoy going somewhere and pretending that I'm a big deal. And we have a very transient nature in the industry, especially in London, because that's all I can speak about. But in London, if you ask, if you push someone too hard, they're just going to go work next door. It's, it's very hard to keep a hold of staff. So, the, so that way it doesn't really work. So for us, we, we try to do more of a positive style of training, where someone comes in, we pretend like they know nothing, and we manage their expectations, which is a very important term. We will say to them, we're going to pretend like you know nothing but bear with it, it's a bit patronizing for the first couple of days. And we'll say, this is how you make a mojito. And they'll say, I know. And you'll say, no, you fucking don't. And you'll show them how you make a mojito. So as when they do it, you're just going, yes, great, well done. And then you'll show them every little thing. I'm going to explain to you what fermentation is. Oh, I know what fermentation is. Yeah, and they don't. And we, we teach them what fermentation is. So as when they then recite it to their guests, it's correct. Well done. And it's just positive, positive, positive. And you're building people up and you're giving them confidence. There's so little confidence outside of arrogance in this industry. It's, it's quite weird. Um, but that is, can I just interrupt you? Yeah, so I think that's a fascinating point Nate mentioned about fermentation. I think some people in the drinks industry in particular will say, well, why is it my responsibility to know about fermentation? Because you're not having that conversation with a guest on a, on a, on a constant basis on the bar. You're making drinks, you're making cocktails, you're serving neat spirits. But for us, it's about understanding the basis of how you make the range of products that you're carrying on your bar. If I asked any one of you to stand on the stage, I'm not going to do it, don't worry, um, to talk us through fermentation or distillation, if I asked you what's the difference between Geneva and gin, or can you describe the, the origins of gin, where's it from, can you describe actually how the, the legal EU definition of vodka, we'll all, stumble up, we'll all stumble upon things we don't know. And that's where we're coming into this idea of um, perpetual training. If you come across that as an idea, we're all perpetually training. It's not a new idea. Um, so, yeah, that's why. Yeah, and you can have um, systems. A lot of ours will put in place systems to ensure that things are done to their standards. They put in checklists. I'm sure we've all seen those in bars. And you'll say, this is everything you need to do during a breakdown. What a horrible, horrible thing to make someone do, to just check the same flipping list every night. It's not how you train people. That's not how you give them confidence. That's not how you inspire them. That's not how you, you, you get them to grow. All you're doing there is going, this is what you do and no more. Make sure you just do these lists and everything will be fine. We have often had a debate about culture versus systems. 
and that's at the crux of our training, is that we want to breed a culture. We want to breed a culture where you're, you're focusing on the guest and what that, that purpose informs on a level of autonomy where you're your own boss. You know, you know how to break down a bar. I'll check it out tomorrow morning when I come in, but you know what you're doing. And you're trying to breed this area of initiative. You're teaching them why they're cleaning it. You, han you can't leave water because you'll get bar flies as opposed to make sure it's dry because you're not informing any kind of thinking in their brains. So you need to breed a culture, which is a very difficult thing to do, but you have to do it from the ground up. Otherwise, when things go wrong, no one's actually ready to deal with that pr unique problem that wasn't part of their checklist. Um, it's, it's the idea of, it's the difference between hospitality and service industry. Servitude, serving, servants. That's not us, and I hope it's none of you in the room. We're all part of the hospitality sector where we're playing the host, and we are hospitable, and we are looking after people. So it's this idea that if, if Nate and I are recruiting and we're asking ourselves, would I go for a drink with this person, a more apt question would be, would I go to their house party or their dinner party? And more to the point, would I go back to their next dinner party after going to that party? If the answer is yes, then employ that person. Well, please don't send them my way. Because that's what you're looking for because your guests are having the house party every single night and it's a house party that's got to be so darn good that people are coming back to it night after night um, so in terms of creating a culture in a bar something we'd all be able just to flick a switch and have a culture of of wanting to know more and wanting to look after the guests we do it through thoughts and theories which is all a bit geeky and it's a bit weird and it's a bit cheesy but they work some of which are borrowed some of which we write ourselves we have one called Sweet Behind the Door. <laughs> yeah, it, actually, it sounds ridiculous saying that on stage. Um, but it's where you will, you will if, if you're a bartender and you've been told to sweep the, the office, you don't have to sweep behind the door, do you? Because if anyone checks, they come in and they open the door and they go, oh, yeah, good job. And then they leave. And you've got away with it. You've got away with it. Because all you've done is said to that person, sweep that area. But if you teach them why and you keep drilling into them why you do it, it's because when someone's in that space, they can see the fucking mess on the floor, then they're, not, then they're going to sweep behind the door. It's just an example. Um, there's lots of them. But there are three things we then want to instill and want to give our, our team members in order to create this culture. They're autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And again, you can see these online all the time. That purpose we've already spoken about is that why, why you get up in the morning, why you turn up. You're there to look after the guests. Um, the autonomy is where you're your own boss, where you've got, you make your own decisions, which is, of course, fueled by your understanding of the purpose and also by the freedom you're given by not having to follow stupid checklists. And then the final one on that is mastery. Mastery is a very, very powerful tool, and it's something that I don't think we as an industry embrace enough. Mastery is that feeling you get, that good feeling you get when you're actually good at something. So if you feel like you're good at your job, you love coming to work. It's the reason why we learn musical instruments. You learn the guitar not because you're going to be a fucking rock star, but because when you first rock out that riff for the first time, you're like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I like that. That's the mastery we want to instill into our team. So in a bar scenario, when a guest comes in and says, yeah, I need a, I need a, I need a beautiful apple whiskey. Great. Well, here's an Irish whiskey because they're the best. And it's got uh, pure pot still or whatever, and it's green spot. And they go, yes, that is exactly what I wanted. Fantastic. And every guest in your shift comes in and has that exact experience. What a great feeling that is. That's what makes the job worth doing. And that's going to make you come in the next day. But how, many, how many people feel like they have mastered any one thing? It's one of the greatest gifts you can give someone when you're training them. Instead of this negative approach, if you get someone to feel like they are master of making martinis or a master of making old fashions, it's not that that's all they do, but that gives somebody the confidence to move on and actually go further afield, especially when it comes to classics. How many bars just really don't know the classic cocktails? We read a, a fascinating uh, Facebook uh, article the other day um, that was uh, clearly well-written and a well-published uh, article. But it was about somebody refusing to pay service charge because somebody um, in a bar they went to, they didn't know uh, a Boulevardier spec. Um, and the, 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 the rant was started online. But I'm mentioning this because hundreds, if not thousands of people commented on this. I don't know if you spotted it. But it was in regards to why should he be paying service charge if someone didn't know that classic cocktail. But my response to that is really simple. It's how was the person made to feel after that? 
no one knows every single classic cocktail under the sun. I'm not suggesting that that is your responsibility to know all those things. It's acknowledging that you don't know those things and, and engaging with how you then move forwards and do it. And you can only do that if you have a mastery of the basis or you feel confident in having mastered the basics of making cocktails, understanding how to put these cocktails together and how they work together, and then a basic understanding of how things would have been made back then compared to the products we have now. It's a, simple, it's, it's a relatively simple uh, process, but very few people can engage in that. Uh, yeah, back to, um, thanks for the rant. Uh, back to, um, on a practical level, um, one of the things we probably do different in our bars is we don't employ managers. There's no managers, like um, there's Lewis and Hebe and I here today, so it's just the bar teams in the bars, no problems whatsoever. A manager doesn't always uh, help situations. If we wanted to create this level of autonomy and everyone's their own boss, then a manager wouldn't fit with that. So everyone does everything, which means in our bars, everyone that works there needs to be trained in the same skill set as everyone else. They can still do it in their own way, but if you work the floor, you also have to be trained on the bar. So when you walk into our bar, you don't know who's going to be on the bar, you don't know who's going to be on the floor, but all the knowledge is the same. You're not all looking to this guy and go, yeah, what's the, what's the spec on a Boulevardier again? Everyone needs to know this, this level of it, which is a, it's a difficult thing to do. So we have to create a level playing field, which kind of dictates my next point, which is that um, we don't uh, pay people hourly. We put them on salary, which in London's quite rare. Um, so we've got an 18-year-old that joined us a couple of months ago. Um, never worked in a bar before, just moved to London. And they'll come in and they're, they go straight on to a salary, a training salary that's 20-something grand. And they're like, Jesus, I've never seen so much money. I was like, yeah, but you're also going to have to do some fucking work for it. And we train them and they, they, we get a loyalty out of them. We get a... So what I'm looking for, it's sustainable. We have people come and they won't leave us. Our staff turnover is next to zero. There's very few people have left us post training. Once they come in and they get through their training, they'll stay with us for a minimum of a year, um, maybe two years, maybe longer, maybe four years, five years. Um, and they're all paid hourly. And we're trying to create an internal level of uh, competition and competitiveness that's stronger than an external level of competition. So as we want to create, and it was a, a phrase I read as well, about creating a conveyor belt of talent, because we, we keep training people, we keep training them, it's perpetually training them, we keep giving them this culture, we keep saying, no, you make your own decision, as long as it's looking after that guest, then that's gonna inform everything you're gonna do next. It's gonna tell you why you're gonna go and read up on these rums at home, because how can you look after your guest if you don't know about them? And a sign of that um, is, is when everyone is fully trained and they're all going across their different positions in the bar and they're not paying attention to what's going on so much in the outside world. They'll go to the other bars and they'll comment on them, but they don't care that such and such has won an award or they don't care that such and such has made this drink. They care about what happens when they come in every single day. I wish we were all chefs. Because yeah. it's a teamwork thing. Sorry, I'm getting very good at interrupting and then making very singular dead-end points, so I'm going to carry on with that. Um, it's a teamwork thing. It's not a competition within house to who can be the best bartender or waiter or waitress. And, you're, and it, we don't give people those titles. They, they're all... They're all there. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's almost like pooling the knowledge and continually encouraging each other to grow. So we may provide a training every week for the team. We might get outside brands to come in and offer their experience and their thoughts on, on training as well uh, uh, once a week. But then we'll also encourage the team to step up, one of the people in the team, and research something for the week and then for them to deliver that. And it's very important at that stage that we're there to, to make sure they're not citing off mislearned knowledge and stuff like that as well. Um, Thanks for bringing that up. I missed the point there. None of our staff have got a job title other than host. They're all host. There's no bartenders. There's no waiters. There's no waitresses. There's no barbacks. You host. You come in. You look after your guests. All right. I'll say this time you're looking after your guests on the bar. This time's on the floor. But still, they're all hosts. Um, and so that brings us back to, to the example I wanted to give there where someone walks into our bar and they say, right, I want a particular kind of whiskey. That decision-making where we try and find the right drink for the right person, that idea of the right drink for the right person is how our interpretation of salesmanship, which means we can't be influenced by brands or retros or incentives or targets. We've never put targets on the team. What are you going to say now? Just careful. <laughs> um, but we, we, don't, we don't accept retros. We don't accept listing fees. Um, in our cocktail menus, there are uh, bound books, and we change them once a year. 
and there's not a single brand mentioned in it. Uh, we, did, we, we, we deliberately avoid the point because you might look at a cocktail and say, oh, it's got um, Batran rum in it. I don't like Batran. That doesn't mean the cocktail tastes of it. I hear it when people put it in there, oh, yes, Amir Pecan. What an esoteric thing to put on a cocktail list. Who on the, out of the public that wants to go drink and knows what Amir Pecan is? Get a grip. Um, so we focus on the flavors. Anyway, that's not part of the talk. Um, <laughs> just by the by. Um, so yeah, so um, someone comes in, so we can't be influenced, so we don't have any retros and everything like that. Our guests have to know everything. Everyone has to do everything. It sounds very communist. It is. Uh, we shouldn't say that in this city. Um, um, but can I interrupt? Yeah. Yeah, because I just I, um, <laughs> <laughs> thank. You. Just just wanted to stop the train of thought. Um, but um, it, equally as provocative, unfortunately, is this idea of retros and stuff. We have big brands in our bars. We do. We use them. We we but we taste the liquid and we decide on that basis whether it's whether it's worth taking on. It's not because of the retro or because of the, the, the cash up front that we can take. This is business, I understand that we're all trying to make profit, but I can honestly say we do not take retros and um, cash fees listings to stock on the bar. I, I, it's, we're never gonna change it, but I hope that more bars actually step up and actually start to do that because it just encourages the big brands getting bigger. And some of them are our friends, we get that, but if, you, if you're only doing, here we go, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, if it, but we need to give some of these smaller brands a chance and an opportunity. I, I was actually a, a rep for a gin before Nate and I formed the company. And I couldn't, I couldn't give gin away. It's actually a good gin. I couldn't give people bottles. It was like, prove it. Prove it's worth it, prove it's good. And how much are you gonna pay for it to go on the back bar? Well, it's a brand new gin, it's good liquid, and I don't have any money. So, you, so it's not getting stocked anywhere, and it's a really brutal reality. Um. Bye, Diageo. Um, so, <laughs> um, so then for the, for the future, what, what do we want to see? What do we want to see happen? We can't just sit here and rant. Um, for us, we want to create a culture of bars and bartenders and, and floor staff and hosts where they are focusing on the guest and their decisions and what they offer guests isn't motivated by incentives or reward or anything that's, and they could, if they want to offer the guests Bacardi, they offer them Bacardi, fine, great. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's got as equal part on the bar as Dorley's or whatever else you want to offer. And we understand then that there is another problem that kind of puts a big obstacle in our way, and that's just the longevity of bars and people who work in bars. And it's a, it's a different talk for a different day, but it's where we want, to, we want to end. We can only train people the way we do it from the ground up. And we can only plant these seeds and make them understand our way of thinking. But when they hit a certain age, they are gonna leave us, they're all gonna move on, and then we look forward to that day because it means they've run their course and they're gonna go blossom somewhere else and they're gonna do whatever it is they have to do. And uh, all we can do is that idea of perpetual training and just keep on going and keep on going. That's very romantic, but I, I, wanted, I, <laughs> I wanted to ask like an idea and uh, ask yourself this in, in your minds rather than show of hands or anything like that. But how many people started out in this industry thinking, do you know what I want to be when I grow up? I want to be a bartender. Or do you know what I want to be when I grow up? I want to be that guy that is cleaning that bar, cleaning those toilets every single night. How many people in this industry started like that? And how many people asked themselves those questions? I love working on a bar. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not just a bartender. I don't call my staff just bartenders. But it's a, it's a very odd thing in our industry that people see this ladder. You start as a bar back. They are the lowest of the low. And then you rise up and you become a junior bartender, then a head bartender, and then a bar manager, and you rise up these ranks. Well, actually, I think another romantic vision would be that we actually ask ourselves, why were we doing it in the first place? Was it just so that we could get more prestige, do less work as we, as we went up the ladder, get more money? We can't bartend, I, I love bartending, but there's a recognition you can't do it every single day for the rest of your life. It's hard bloody work. But I love bartending and it's a very honorable profession. At the same time as an incredibly arrogant, inducing profession, you're making drinks. <laughs> Thank you. It's not, it's not a revelation though, is it? You are at the end of the day making drinks. I think we could also be a little bit humble about that. <laughs> Um, so that's about us, isn't it? Yeah, yeah so, that's a good um, place to end. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we've probably offended quite a few people. Um, we would genuinely invite questions. Um, we're very passionate about this. And we could talk about this for hours and hours. Um, if you do have any questions, please, sh um, we'll hand the mic around. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs>
<laughs> Hi. Um, you, I know that you were talking about perpetual training, but when you have a new person join your company and you're doing that, we're going to pretend that you know nothing and show you how to do everything. How long does that actually take you? It very much depends on the actual person. Um, everyone comes in and they immediately start by being, they, they do what I suppose is a week on the floor because we teach them how to look after guests first and there's an awful lot of homework they're going to get and it depends on that individual. Some people will get it in a week, some people will take two weeks and then we're going to bring them onto the bar and do their bar training. We were lucky that um, the way our bar is set up We've got a dispense section, which you know, plenty of bars and all have. So they're not really dealing with guests. They're learning how to make drinks, and they'll spend two weeks minimum on that. And then they'll move on to the front bar, where they're making drinks whilst looking after guests. So they're putting the two together. So in an ideal world, with the ideal person, it'll take four weeks. But there's never an end, is there? They're always learning. They're always finding something else, and they're always getting into it. There is an end to the amount of bottles we have on the bar, because you know, it's not that big. But do you need this? So I just want to add to that because I think it's a brilliant question. Uh, this seems like a never-ending thing and training is incredibly expensive. Um, but it does reap rewards and that's the whole idea. Um, but on, on that note, um, the, the, the important thing to do in the training period is to encourage that individual to continue to train once the training has ended. So it's, it's almost like this is the start. You give them the foundations, the basics. It's what you get at university. You don't suddenly become a genius after walking out of university. They teach you how to teach yourself. And that's basically what a training period will be. You teach, you teach through those basics so that then they can go forwards and learn because there's continually new products coming out all the time anyway. Hi, sorry, two questions. The first one, your bar focuses on gin and rum. Why, why are those two spirits? Yeah, um, so to answer that one, gin and rum, that's our first bar. Um, it's a long story, um, but to, to cut it short, uh, we used to own a gin bar, and it was very gin, it was 100% gin. Um, we had 350 gins in the bar, and this is five years ago, right at the, or four or five years ago, right when we started the company. Um, we were doing gin masterclasses galore to the public, and gin, you know, this was the birth of the regeneration of gin. So we, we did thousands of gin masterclasses, and in researching more and more and more about the history of gin, uh, we were realizing that it wasn't, just, it wasn't just the gin story. This whole idea of mercantile shipping and the history of spices and trade. And if you just list the different spices and commerce from around the world, they're all intertwined. And it's a, it's a story about Catholics and Protestants. It's a story about nations vying for land across the world. And it's the reason people are speaking certain languages in certain countries. It's a massive story. And we thought the best way to tell that story when we opened up our new bar, our, mer our merchant house bar, was to combine rum into that so we could tell a much broader story of tea, spice trade, sugar, um, and, and how it was all intertwined together. That's why we call it merchant house, this idea of mercantile history. So second question, with uh, all your staff knowing every section of the bar, who's responsible, where does the responsibility fall for things that go wrong or ordering or um, who reprimands people when things aren't getting done? It's, it's a good question. I think that Nate and I are very, um, we try and breed a, a culture where everyone's looking after each other and it's this idea of like a tacit agreement. Everyone does everything. But inevitably, because we, because we take in very young and very inexperienced people, they do need that um, mature, uh, mature looking at us, um, for, <laughs> for figure to, to, to watch over it. Um, and we're very passionate as well about being present in our bars because you're, you, you've always got an eye on, on all those tables. So you're sort of keeping an eye on those people that you don't know. Um, um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, shut up. Um, and also managing expectations. If they know what's expected of them, then it doesn't take much to walk in and just go, oh, that's not quite right. And whoever's there will do it. Everyone's responsible. So it doesn't matter if someone else broke the glass, someone else will clean it up. So they call each other out quite a lot, which is nice. You, uh, you said that you, you don't want people who've worked in too many bars necessarily to hire. Have you had any luck reprogramming anyone after having worked in a few bars? Is that possible? <laughs> um, how do you get on with people that sort of have experience to be re reprogram them? That's an interesting way of putting it. Anyone can be trained to do anything. 
Um, and quite often, training, the word training can get confused with the word conditioning. And the, yes, we, yes, yeah, you can, you can relearn, you can get them to do it, and you can breed it into them. It's much easier from the ground up. It's much, it's much, much easier. But we have done it. Um, and when I say anyone can learn anything, if I was teaching Lewis how to make a martini or to not stir a Negroni or whatever, um, he might keep making the same mistake, but he's only going to make it 12 times, 15 times. So if I've got the patience and the stamina to tell him 13 times, one more time than it takes, then he'll get there. Um, but different people are different. Some people just do not fucking listen. Um, I just wanted to ask, you said that your staff retention rates are really good. Um, but I think, sorry, I'm forming this in my head. Um, one of the things that um, struck me about what you were saying was everyone is just called host. There's no rising through the ranks or anything like that. So how does that, because people like, often like to feel like they're progressing and they're getting their, that kind of affirmation, how are you kind of encouraging that kind of feeling for someone and keeping hold of them for longer? Yeah, I, th I think um, to, th there's many answers to that, actually. It's a complicated question. I think one of the immediate thoughts that comes to my mind there is this idea of uh, we're very, we're very, we actually happen to have a very new bars to, to a certain degree. So they see that the rewards are coming from all angles. They're coming from the individual guest that gives them that feedback, but also it, it comes from the fact that the bars themselves are growing and they're part of that and they're part of the, uh, seeing the bars growing. But I think it's also about why they were employed in the first place. Because if, and that's this golden circle analogy, if they know absolutely why they're doing it and that that's at the core of everything they do, then it all comes, but that's the reward. The reward comes from why they're doing it. So uh, it's not so much about, and that's where, that's where I was going with the train of thought about what's wrong with being a bartender for, for your life. Uh, it's this idea of that we have this instilled in us that we need to move forwards, like there's some sort of progression train that you, you need to be moving forwards. And, and that's exactly the same problem that ties in with moving from one bar to another. Well, I'll start on this bar, it's not very well known, but then from there I can leapfrog to this other bar. And from there I can then go to this award-winning bar. And, and it's all a complete false, false economy. You have to ask, we ask ourselves and we ask the staff that we're taking on to ask themselves why they really want to do it. And that, that has to come first. And I think that sort of answers itself as things move forwards. Yeah. Uh, you say something like uh, they don't have a best bartender, and the best waiters. You know, no, no, not everybody uh, works equal. There are some best people in the worst a little bit. You know, you, uh, you know, how, how are you through going through that? I didn't quite. Sorry, I, sorry, I didn't quite understand. You, you know, you, if you say you don't have the best bartender, the best waiters on your on, yeah. on your shift, and uh, you know, no, no one works equal. They are best bartender, better bartenders and worse bartenders, same as waiters. You know, if, if you say someone, somebody's good, you have to show how he's good. Yeah, you work, your, your job's done, it's, it's good. Um, for us, the way we have set up our bars as well, there isn't, um, there isn't a volume game. I mean, there's two ways, to, two ways to run a bar, isn't there? You get a lot of heads in, in a quick, keep them coming, keep them coming, keep them coming, you make them drinks high volume. Or you, when they're in there, it's about retention. And for us, retention trumps acquisition every time. So when guests come in, they sit down. Which means maybe there are some people who have definitions over what makes a bartender better than another bartender. But for us, it's not about how good of a bartender you are, it's how good you look after the guest. And yeah, there's going to be a girl at our place who's a fucking rubbish bartender by some people's standards. But I love sitting on her station because she's great crack. You know, there, there, there are other people bring different qualities to it. And yes, that means you might come in and you, I mean, these guys come drinking in our bar, not that they ever pay, but they come in and they'll might see uh, one of their favorite members of the team working a section that night. So they'll go sit in that section because we've got the same faces coming in all the time. They know the team, so they know where they want to be. Like, oh, I'll sit at the bar tonight. Cool. And you get, so yeah, swings and roundabouts. No. Sorry, I guess also to sum it up really quickly, it's, the, it's this idea that it's teamwork. So you may have people that are stronger than others in your team, but you're only ever delivering your venues or your bars or whatever it is that as, as a team and as, as one, basically. So you, in, 
Yeah, you're only as good as the weakest bartender there. So it's not about putting your best bartender on the busiest station per se. It's about how quickly can you get that person that you would consider slower, let's say, um, or they have less knowledge or they know less classics or whatever it would be. How quickly can we get that person up to speed so that the whole team is performing to a level that we, that we see as anyone can work on any station and look after any guest? It's not we give the best the, the, if a critic comes through the door, we'll give our best bartender to that critic because that's a false economy. It, it, it's about how quickly you can get the team up to the standard that you're happy with. Do you have a fixed training plan? Was it in here? Sorry. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Do you have a fixed training plan or is it more an intuitive training you do with your staff? Such as a timeline for when you're in a zone, a new, new bartender or... or uh, no, we don't, have a, we don't really have a fixed training plan, no. Um, it is just an ongoing cycle. Because pe different people join the team at different times. So, it, um, no, we don't have a, like, a pack that we give them. They have to go through all this and all the rest. So, no, not really. Don't rush, Jared. You're all right. I've got all sorts of questions here, Matt. It's not just Jim Lamp, Jim <laughs> if you tell me the spec. Over here. Hello. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how you work with the back of the bar, like your dishwashers. Uh, for me, the dish is 50% of what happens in the bar. So if my dishwasher, the team in the dish aren't up to date or as engaged as the front people, uh, I won't be, uh, I can't only rely on the team in the front. So how, how, do, you, uh, how do you get them involved if they are also hosts, or they're like, are they treated, treated differently? <laughs> um, in, well, for us, I mean, we've got two bars. One's very big, which means that, um, and everyone does different, different roles on the night, and one of those roles on that night means they do everything. They're kind of like a float, so they'll do it. Neither of our two bars are high volume, so we don't ever have quite such a big buildup of things. So it's less of a drama in our sort of setups, and it's just rotated quite a lot. Okay, thank you. Um, when you have your staff, uh, as you told us, they're uh, really new, or they're new to the, to the scene, to the work, when they start with you, and obviously they uh, advance, and they reach a certain point where they get an expertise in a certain field, they are interested, naturally everybody is interested in one field or some fields, and advances in it, and uh, do you allow uh, your staff to train your other staff? And if so, uh, is it a formal training, or is it just during work, you know, you're talking with each other, you're passing along ideas? Um, we, we work quite closely with them, and then we'll do a session. So we'll do a session with the team. We do uh, quite regular trainings. And that's one of, the, one of the beauties of having all of our staff on salary, is that they can all be there at a certain time every day. And it's not ruining their week, and it's not adding to our costs. It's just part and parcel of what that job is. Um, so yeah, we, we work with them. We work with them on everything. I and mean, if someone's very interested in Sherry, then we will get a sherry guy to come and sit on their section for a while, or we'll talk them through it, or we'll work something out, and then we'll let them do a teaching to the rest of the team. Yeah, and, and also, uh, w without sounding like an absolute prat, um, the, just because somebody's interested in, let's say, rum, doesn't mean that they will work in our gin and rum bar. Um, and th they get to learn all about rum. For us, yes, we'll encourage people to, to learn uh, very specifically about what interests them. But again, it's, we will always draw it back to the guest and what they're going to receive. And if one person knows all about rum but doesn't know anything about any of the other products, then it, it's no good for us. So it needs to be a shared common knowledge. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. What do you We're do? Yes, I'm here again. Oh, sorry. What is uh, your solution to uh, differences in the team itself? So if you find there are uh, more discrepancies, who solves these? Oh, right, if there's, if there's, for example, conflict between certain team members. Yes. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. What um, is your 
Yeah, the it's, it, again, we have a thought and theory for that. So um, without getting cheesy, we, we, we were taught this right when we first started bartending. It's not about a chain of command or anything. It's this idea of, we, we take the idea of a beach ball. And if I'm holding up a beach ball, I can see green, blue, and white, but you can see red orange and green, we're, we're both right to a certain degree. If we're going to work together, then we have to, we have to recognize that we're all coming from different angles here and that you have to, you have to find a way through it. There's no, um, it, it, because, it's, because this would obviously be done on an individual basis, other than that, and other than saying, guys, work out your differences on your own, it's very, unless there was a very specific incident that we had to step in. And get them to sign a code of, yeah. Get them to sign a code of conduct. Code of conducts have solved so many problems for us. So it's part of the things they sign when they get in, saying how they, we expect them to treat other members of the team. And if anyone's in breach of that, it doesn't matter what the reason is, they're in breach of that. And uh, it, it solves an awful lot of problems. It's they, managing expectations. Because they're, right. they're, they're sharing a common goal of making sure the guest has a pe pleasant experience. So it all comes back to that. All right, we're out of time. So uh, thanks very much for listening. Sorry for the swearing and sorry for the rants. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.